Hey everybody, I'm Sam Solomon and this is Signal Tower. Today I'm joined by Saul Orwell, who is the co-founder of Examine.com, which is an independent and unbiased source for nutritional information. Saul, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Sam. So let's start, um, tell us a little about yourself. Who are you? Well, uh, I tell most people that I am basically living the immigrant dream. Uh, came to North America when I was 14, started dabbling in websites. And by the time I was finishing up university or in the middle of university, I had incorporated my company and it was doing pretty well. And most of what I was doing at the time was just, I was finding things that I found interesting. Um, and then I put, you know, I put some information out on it and people would respond and then I put more effort into it and it would kind of grow out of that. Um, and so after that, I took about like a five year sabbatical. I kind of retired. I went around, uh, lived in South America and the States for a while. Uh, and then I came back. And, uh, you know, that's where you found me was through examine.com. So what happened was when I came back, I'd become uh, quite soft around the edges. Uh, in, in Argentina, I could, I could uh, order ice cream for delivery online. So every day I'd be ordering, you know, a liter of Dosa de Leche con Brownie ice cream. And then in Manhattan, I was literally, you know, you look at a cafe and there's a window like the, right above it. That was, I was living there. So, you know, in the morning you'd wake up and you'd smell those cookies. And it's kind of illegal not to go down and eat those <laughs> cookies then, right? So by the, by the time I came back to Toronto, there was a lot more of me than had been when I left. And uh, as I looked into, you know, I have an engineering background, so I'm kind of analytical oriented. So I looked into, you know, why does this work or why does not work? I realized there was a huge gap in terms of taking the scientific evidence, of which there was a lot of, and trying to make sense of it. You know, everyone's trying to sell you supplements or this diet plan or get ripped in six weeks and all these kind of plans. And um, so that's kind of how I got into Examine. Um, at the time, my co-founder was about to, he was finishing up dietetics, which is for RDs, dietitians, and he was looking into his PhD, and I said, you know, your PhD, you can do whatever you want, you know, that will always be around for you, why don't we try to build something cool? And so three and a half years later, I believe we built something cool, and, and here I am sitting right in front of you. You definitely have. Um, I'm curious, kind of, with, with you moving around, um, because you moved around kind of before um, I guess before you were in high school and then you moved around after college, how has that um, kind of affected your outlook? Uh, I think part of it for me has been that uh, I'm a big fan of finding people smarter than you, which to be honest is not that hard if you actually think about it because there's a lot of people in this world. And my goal is to, you know, give them responsibilities and trust them to do it. And sometimes that fails, you know, some people need direction or they need you to be kind of looking over their shoulder and they want your approval. But at other times you'll find people who like the stability but who also like the challenges of, you know, here's our objective, do what you need to do, you have a budget and you have these constraints and, and make it work. So, you know, my goal, and I've always seen, uh, seen it as this, is to help find, uh, build a system and process for people to work in. Even with exam, you know, by the end of this year, my daily involvement will be down to maybe 30 minutes a day or a couple of hours a week because, you know, I have people who are doing the research, I have people who are doing the, the guest posts or doing the editing, people who are developing the website. I basically created myself to be redundant, which I think is, is the way to approach things. Definitely. Well, yeah, let's get in and kind of talk a little bit about examine.com. You kind of briefly touched on on how it's how it how it started. Um, that was two years ago. Um, you know what what kind of how, how did it look? How did examine.com look two years ago? Well, okay, so we started three and a half years ago. Three and a half years ago. I was actually in Panama, and uh, I was visiting uh, actually one of my friends, and he was talking about weight loss, and I was like, yeah, you know, this is this is this is what you kind of do, and he was saying, you know, how do I how do I know this information? It's kind of hard to look this up. And that's when I had the idea. And so when I talked to my co-founder, Curtis, I said, you know, you can do the research part. That's what he likes doing. He loves reading up these, you know, scientific papers, uh, making sense of them in the bigger picture and whatnot. And I said, you can do that all day long. And what I'll do is I'll take care of everything else. You know, I'll do the web design. I'll give you a place. I'll do the programming. I'll give you a place where you can input your information. Um, I like emailing people and talking to people. So, you know, I'll do the business development. I'll reach out to people. Uh, in terms of... One of the problems we did have at that time was we didn't really know how we were going to make money. I mean, we were linking to Amazon just for the search results. So if you're looking at vitamin D, we'd say, okay, you know, go to Amazon, buy vitamin D. But we knew it wasn't, um, 
the long-term plan. We knew that if we did a good enough job, we'd become an information repository, at which point, you know, information is, is important, right? I mean, uh, my favorite, one of my favorite examples is the Picasso principle, which is this woman's in, in a store and she sees Picasso and she says, oh my God, it's Picasso. She gives him a napkin and she says, can you please draw something for me? So he spends five minutes, he draws it, he gives it to her and he goes, okay, that'll be $30,000. She goes, you know, how the hell can that be $30,000? It only took you five minutes. He said, well, it took me 30 years to get to my five minutes. Right. And so part of my, my viewpoint was, you know, we'll spend this energy, we'll spend this effort, we'll become the source of information on, you know, scientifically backed, evidence-based uh, supplementation and nutrition, at which point, you know, you then have a valuable base of knowledge that you can sell. So the first few years were just, you know, here's the basic outline, here's the basic site. I didn't really throw myself into it. Um, I was just seeing, you know, how the response was. And as we grew, you know, we grew from 100 visitors a day to 1,000 visitors a day to 5,000 to 10,000. That's kind of when you knew, all right, we hit, we're on to something. People are really responding to it. So, you know, let's redevelop the design or let's invest more into the program. So Curtis has to work less to figure out, you know, how to connect pages and whatnot. So that's kind of, it was a very iterative process. There was nothing, okay, you know, here's the woman, now we're going to get rich, you know. It was just step by step, a grit and grind kind of thing. Right. And so, and so now, a lot of what you're doing is, and, and when you said you look, kind of looked to Amazon, you had uh, Amazon kind of referral links set up, yeah. right? And so you'd get four or five percent of the sale or whatever, something like that. Yeah, it goes from like five, and you get ranked up, I think, eight and a half it was. So we were in the eight or 8.25, like the second high bracket. And, and, and now you guys kind of are selling these guides. Examine.com obviously has a wealth of information. That's kind of a way of, of making it maybe a little bit more easily digestible. Or yeah. um, How did you decide that that was, was what you were going to do? To be honest, it was just, I'm very fanatical about uh, reading what people are saying about us. I don't necessarily get into flame wars. You know, people say dumb things about you. I, I'm, I don't get out there and get defensive. But it is important to me to know what people are saying when they don't know you're kind of watching. So you can kind of get the honest truth. And, you know, people said, you know, I like the site, but I wish there was a quick way for me to look up information. You know, oh, this is this information is awesome, but I wish it was in one place. Right. So our original product, which was geared more towards the researchers or people who really love the evidence, you know, it's right now it's 1,187 pages, I think, when I last looked at it a few days ago. It's got 3,000 plus studies. It's this bomb of knowledge. But for people who like it, it was just a way of, you know, I open it up, I see the information, I'm done. I don't need to browse the website, I don't need to look up individual studies. It was very useful to them. So we never detracted anything from our actual website. We kept it as open, as free as possible. We just did this. And then when we, you know, we pulled out the, this reference I was talking about, and we've, I think we're at 12 or 13 or 15,000 sales, you know, we were getting feedback from people saying, okay, you know what, I really liked it, but it was too much for me. It was too overwhelming. I, you know, I tried to make sense of it, but it was just, it, you know, I couldn't get my mind around it. And that's kind of, you know, I, at that point I was like, okay, you know what, if it was my mom and she was trying to read this, she would just go, you know, this makes no sense and she'd throw it at me. So the next product that we launched a few, uh, few months ago was our stack guides and it was the exact opposite. You know, we said, okay, here are 16 goals that people would be interested. Uh, popular ones, of course, muscle building, fat loss, but even stuff like anxiety or insulin uh, sensitivity for people who are diabetic. We said, okay, we're going to remove all the science. We're not going to make it overwhelming. We're going to have an outline that we're going to follow and it'll be like 20, 25 pages of actionable information. So you don't need to go, okay, you know what, do I really care about my hormone here or enzyme there? No, just tell me what to do and I'll say, okay, you know what, if I'm muscle building, but hey, you know, I work out in the morning, so what should I do? Or hey, I work out, I do this, or I work out twice a day, what consideration should I have in my uh, supplementation and nutrition? So there's, there are like two opposing, you know, uh, parts of the spectrum, but we were only able to get there because we were very diligent about uh, gathering feedback. You know, we have surveys uh, that we ask our users. We have feedback surveys on the website. So we're always trying to find out what people are looking for, what we're missing, and then it's it's and it's then a process of okay, do we implement this into the main site, or is it something that's a separate thing that we should you know spin off into a project? So that's kind of our uh, thought process. Cool. It's um, very organic, I think is the way I'd say it. As you guys kind of started and 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 kind of built up traffic where did a lot of your 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 visitors come from well so we originally founded examine.com on reddit 
Uh, I've been a member of Reddit for eight plus years now. And my co-founder was up for moderator of the year. And he came in second to a bunch of moderators who worked as a team. So as far as I'm concerned, he was moderator of the year. But, you know, we were always on Reddit. And, you know, I'm, I'm part of Reddit like Toronto, Reddit NBA, this, this, this. My, Curtis is part of all these other ones too. So, you know, when I was asking these questions in the fitness uh, subreddit, um, you know, I could see that Curtis was smart and these other people were smart. So when we created examine.com, uh, there was a there was a bit of a there was a nice groundswell of support, right? Right off the bat, redditors knew that hey, we are from Reddit. We're not trying to leech Reddit for traffic. We're not trying to you know build off their backs. We're part of it. And still today, you know, even to this day, three and a half years later, I still visit Reddit most days. I still comment about things that have nothing to do with fitness or business or anything like that. I'm still part of it, and as is Curtis. So that was the initial surge, I would say. Uh, after that, though, to be honest, it's just been uh, bit by bit. I mean, my and our goal has always been that uh, when people talk about supplements, we want them to link to us and not to Wikipedia or any other website. Right. So that started happening, right? For example, uh, one of Dr. Ross's favorite supplements these days is green coffee, all right? Green coffee beans. And if you search for green coffee beans on Google, we're not in the top 10. But I think it's two or three articles that talk about, okay, this is, does not actually work. They actually link to us as a source of information. So what's happened is that um, you know we're not as reliant on Google as most people are, or even my other websites have been and are. It's it's nice. Um, so it's just been a lot of referral traffic. Our Facebook uh, pages, Facebook, uh, we get our stuff shared a lot. I mean, I track that too. Every day we get you know maybe a couple thousand visitors a day from Facebook, and then something will suddenly spike. We released marijuana about five days ago or right. our summary on it and you know boom there's only a spike of 30 40 50 thousand visitors so um, it, it's just across the field or across the spectrum it's no one single website so a lot of that traffic is is maybe not directly from Google but from other authoritative uh, authoritative sources kind of linking to you and citing you as kind of the the core reference yeah, exactly. I mean, Google is maybe 35% of our traffic, which is a decent chunk, but it's not as big as it is wow. from websites, right? Considering right. how massive Google is. So it's um, it's kind of nice. I mean, you know, we I, I'm on the advisory board for uh, Schwarzenegger's website. So, you know, we wrote the Protein Bible and whatnot on Schwarzenegger. We, we've been published in most uh, major magazines, you know, in Men's Health, Men's Fitness. We've been, been The Guardian. We were in their Sunday uh, nutrition uh, section a few months ago. So. Uh, it, it's nice that we're big enough that we don't have to rely or we're not concerned. Oh, no, we're not number three for creatine anymore on Google. Now our traffic is suddenly nosedive, right? We, we're almost, I wouldn't say purely, but we're almost uh, independent of Google where even if they were to ban us tomorrow, we would still be a profitable and growing uh, organization. That's, that's, that's really interesting because there are so many, you know, you think generally content heavy businesses and that's probably changed recently because you see all these kind of like viral sites or whatever that rely more on social media. But traditionally content heavy sites are really, um, you know, really kind of lean pretty heavily on Google. Yeah. Um, I'm very paranoid about Google. I mean, Google giveth and Google taketh away, right? So uh, to me, any traffic that Google sends away is bonus. You know, I won't, of course, say no to it, but I do not trust them. <laughs> I would never trust them. And, uh, you know, I've seen businesses just, just disappear overnight. Even massive websites like Metafilter, they did a post, I think, a few months ago about how Google was banning them, banning them, or, or slowly, I mean, uh, removing them just because they were this massive website. And just because Metafilter was big enough, then Matt Cuts, you know, it got Matt Cuts' attention, who's, you know, in charge of Google search development. And then suddenly their ban was lifted, and now suddenly they have five times the amount of traffic they were getting yesterday, right? That's, that's not something you can build a sustainable organization on. Um, so we're also big about partnerships. We're working with, you know, exercise organizations, uh, uh, people with their own brands, people that are well-established in fitness that know what they're talking about. So there's an affiliate model in a way. There's a referral traffic. It's just... We, we just have not relied on Google. And that's been a very uh, focused thing of ours, is to stay away from Google. Right. Well, because I was going to ask you, Google's, I, I, I'm sure you've seen it, but obviously they scrape content from Wikipedia and a lot of these other pages yeah. and, and put them directly into the search results and kind of cuts the person who, who came up with it out of it. Um, so I was going to ask you kind of like how you felt about that, but I think you explained that pretty well. Yeah, um, it's, I, I mean, to add, you know, it's kind of, uh, I mean, Wikipedia is different because it's public uh, license and, and that's kind of the agreement with it. But, you know, Google is, uh, uh, I started off with SEO way back in 2000 it was, 
Uh, Aaron Wall of SEO book is constantly railing against Google's abuses and whatnot. So it's just something, again, it's a bonus, but I would never, ever rely on Google for uh, my livelihood. Well, so I guess my next question then is, is initially, uh, you've got, obviously you guys are kind of an authoritative source now, but initially did you do any outreach to, to get these partnerships from other blogs or um, I guess right. how did you get in, in touch with these people? What was that first email or call like? Yeah, so you know, I've worked online for a long time and I've received the most ludicrous emails, you know, just blaming me for things I have absolutely no idea what I had any relationship with, right? So it's always been my practice that whenever I read something interesting, I will send an email or I'll send a tweet out saying, hey, that was cool. Uh, this is true for well beyond fitness. This is true for things I have absolutely no desire to ever get involved in. You know, if I'm reading a political uh, article on even, let's say, Israel and Palestine, I'm like, okay, you know, that was an interesting viewpoint and I hadn't heard it before. I'll send them an email. So it's always been in my nature to say, hey, you know, this is interesting, cool stuff. And so when I first got into, started getting healthy, I wasn't thinking about examine.com, I wasn't thinking about building anything. And uh, I have a genetic disorder called Ehlers-Danlos, which means the collagen in my ligaments don't settle properly. So my shoulder can pop out, I've torn both ACLs, my wrists pop out, stuff like that. And as I was working on getting fit, you know, my shoulder issues would flare up. So I would be reading about mobility and, and flexibility and whatnot, and I'd read these interesting articles. So I would email these people saying, hey, you know, I just wanted to thank you. You know, your article was very interesting. I didn't think about this, this, this. And it just so happened that when I got into fitness years later, and this is about two and a half years later after I started getting fit, it was just, okay, you know, I already know these people. They already know that, um, I kind of know my stuff. And uh, sorry, another big thing actually was that a lot of people in, uh, you know, when they build websites that are out of the tech industry, that are out of the web development industry, they don't know what they're doing, right? Like you will look on their website and you'll see the most glaring and idiotic mistakes. You'll be like, okay, you know what? Like if you took five minutes, auditing your own website, you'd be say, you know, why is this like this? Why is this like this? So what happened was when I'd reach out to them, I would occasionally, because I am from a tech background, I'd say, hey, you know what, these are some things you might want to think about. So uh, I remember uh, one of them was, uh, this guy was a trainer in Boston, and I used to be part of local SEO, and his address listing on the bottom was kind of cramped up, where he was trying to be stylistic, and he had dots between each space, and I was like, hey, you might be confusing Google. You might want to remove these dots because, you know, Google amalgamates all the information. So I, I'm a big fan of, you know, know what you're good at. And so I was good in web development. So I use that and my outgoing personality to establish, okay, I know what I'm talking about, but I don't talk about things I don't know my stuff about. That's so when nice. I came about with Examine, I said, hey, you know, this is what we're building and we're trying to build a Wikipedia and I'm trying to build it like this, this, this. They kind of already knew who I was. I wasn't this random stranger saying, hey, you know, like my stuff, I'm cool, I'm cool. And uh, I think that's kind of was a big part of our success was that uh, these people already knew who I was, but they knew that I wasn't just, you know, unless I was playing the long two and a half year game, but you know, that's way too much effort, right? So they, they, they knew who I was and, and that I think helped us a lot down the road. Well, kind of speaking about those people um, that you know, kind of now work with, what you know, what's the team like at Examine? How 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 are you guys structured? So uh, we have, you could say, well, it's management, but Kamal is the director of Examine, so he's kind of in charge. Um, he's replacing me. Let's say if I was CEO before, he's becoming that guy now. Um, it's his job to you know get make sure everything's. Uh, getting done. It's his job to oversee that our stack guys is done well, that our supplement goals is being done well, that our upcoming ERD does well. Uh, he himself has an MBA and MPH, which is a master's in public health from Hopkins, and he was actually doing his PhD in nutrition. So he has this nice business savvy, but also big picture understanding from his uh, public health masters, and also nitty gritty from his you know PhD candidacy in nutrition. So he's, uh, I would say he's the man in charge. At that point then, I mean, we're almost like a peer review organization. Curtis does the research, he then sends it off to our editors, the editors, you know, uh, vet it, they make sure the citations make sense. Our internal policy is that for every researcher we have two editors. So whenever someone researches something, two editors must check it, and then it goes by a reviewer's process, which again, this is like peer review. Our reviewers are essentially contractors that know their stuff in very specific areas. So about a couple months ago, we did a post on kombucha, and uh, you know, there's a big thing about toxicology. So we had a PhD in toxicology who would look over our work. Hmm. So I mean, 
Sorry, I kind of got segued. Uh, so in, in terms of structure, it would be, you know, we have the, the researchers and the editors are kind of all the same, but one person's doing the research while the other two are doing the editing. So we have three primary guys there. Kamal's to oversee everything happens, and then the reviewers are in the background to, to ensure that all the, um, all the information being presented is accurate. And then on the side is just, uh, we have Andre, who's in charge of technology, to redevelop the website, and that's it. We're actually a very heavy research organized uh, or, uh, company. We're not, uh, I mean, we're very profitable. So, and uh, I'm a big fan of reading about history. So I just read about uh, Sega's history, and I'm just reading about Marvel Comics. That book came out, I think, a few months ago. Um, and it's just very interesting that, you know, when you lose focus on what made you good, um, and this is a very common thing in both comics and in the video game industry, right? So our, our bread and better is that our research is what drives everything else. So we're not concerned about having a marketing person or having a sales person or a biz development person saying, hey, you know, you got to do this, you got to do this. It's, uh, we will not be an organization in which the tail wags, you know, the rest of the dog kind of stuff. I totally blew, blew that uh, phrase, but uh, the research dictates everything we do. So that, that's our structure. You, uh, you talked about how kind of the, the researchers write and send stuff to editors and things like that. So you, you, do you guys all work remotely? Nobody's, you guys don't have one centralized office, or do you? Correct. We, no, we all work remotely. Uh, I'm based in Toronto. Curtis is in Ottawa. Kamal's in, in uh, San Francisco, and then other guys are you know, in the Midwest, U.S., and whatnot. Um, in a way, it's a good thing because researchers tend to be uh, centric, I think is the right word to use. You know, we all have our little peculiarities. Curtis loves being up at like four in the morning and, and then smashing everything, whereas Kamal usually doesn't come in until noon, right? So this way, it's just, Curtis does the work, then he emails it, or you know, we have a task assignment, right? So he emails it to the editors, the editors edit it, it goes back to Curtis, he confirms it. And so uh, being, in my opinion, in a way, being remote has made us better because everything is, you know, it's a linear progress. It's not a collaborative at the same time. You know, so research doesn't work, editor edits, researcher gives back his feedback, back and forth, back and forth, but you don't need to be in the same room at the same time because that's not how research works. Right, you have to read it, you have to digest it, you have to analyze it, and then you have to say something, so uh, it works better that way, actually, for us. That's interesting. And yeah. internally, what, do you guys just use email? Are you using Slack? What kind of, what tools are you using to help facilitate that? So we use both uh, Google Docs and Asana. So Asana is a task management software, um, and so you know we, we let's say we have a master list of uh, supplements that we're going to cover. So we'll have a spreadsheet that covers the kind of we have three main sections internally. We have a major supplement such as vitamin E or marijuana, something that's massive in scope. Uh, we have food products, blueberries, for example, and then we have you know the the exotic, the esoteric ones that have like maybe five studies. So we have these spreadsheets and these documents that contain the wholesale information, and then everything is task assigned for, uh, and that's where Kamal's in charge, right, as the boss. It's his job to make sure everything is running smoothly, everyone has due dates, we have soft due dates, stuff like that. Um, and and uh, examine.com itself, I was kind of looking through it and trying to see you know, what CMS was behind it. I thought maybe it would have been WordPress, but it doesn't look like it. How How is the back end of that set up? Because you guys have to go through iterations and the articles change and things like that how how does right. how is that what's the, the CMS like so I wrote myself in uh, PHP and it's connected to a MySQL database um, it's very it's revision history based kind of like Wikipedia where if uh, we have all revisions stored so if you're editing the vitamin D page it'll save the previous version you'll submit your edit and we'll have the two versions. So in case, uh, I mean, nothing can go by us without editor approval. It's not like Wikipedia where it goes live instantly. But even if we make a mistake or if someone says, hey, you know, we suppressed the study, we go, well, look at our history. We have absolutely nothing to hide. So it, it has been custom built. Um, there are a lot of benefits to it. Instead of using WordPress, there's a lot less overhead. We have our own kind of wiki code uh, that we use. Everything can be, you know, if you put any supplement name in our text area in brackets, it automatically links to that page for that supplement. So it makes things a bit easier. Uh, we are currently rewriting the entire thing from the ground up because wow. I admit I threw it together. <laughs> I wish at that time it was just Curtis and I, and now, you know, now we have like a copy editor involved. There's a lot more process involved. So we are rewriting it so that the process is baked into the system. 
So, you know, when Curtis does his research, he says, okay, I'm done researching. He'd say, you know, he'd click a button and then it instantly notifies the editors, all right, this is now ready to be edited. These are the updates that have happened since you've last seen them. So it's being baked into the system, our entire peer review process. Interesting. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of making life as easy as possible. Uh, the programmer's job is, is not to be, e like their job is not easy, but it is their job to make the talents <laughs> Uh, life easy because we're not a tech company, right? It's their job to make the researchers and editors and copy editors and everybody else. It's uh, it's their job to make their life easier. That's a good point. Um, so you guys pretty successful. Um, I'm sure at some point in time, the thought has crept in your mind: Do I need to raise funding? Um, do I need to go out and meet meet people? But you guys are you're bootstrapped, right? Yeah. So I, I'm. Uh... I don't know if it's my immigrant mindset or whatever, but I've always been very independent-minded. Uh, uh, I mean, I legally changed my name. I wasn't even not even born Saul Orwell. So I remember back in the day, in 2004 it was, I think, uh, I launched local search uh, service in Toronto. And uh, we were actually like Yelp and Foursquare before they were, well, before Foursquare existed. We had badges, we had user rankings, you know, we had this, we had that. And I had, I think it was, well, it was over a dozen venture capitalists, you know, contacted me and said, you know, we want to invest in what you've built. And I had no desire for it. Uh, I had no desire for a lot of money. Uh, I like to travel. I don't have a fancy car. I like, you know, walking or subwaying and all that kind of stuff. So I've always been more of a lifestyle business guy than, a, you know, I got to make my 10 million or my 50 million and buy my yacht and, and all that kind of stuff. So with that in mind, you know, that's why I never accepted funding. And so for examine.com, uh, yeah, I bootstrapped it out of my own pocket. It did cost me uh, a couple hundred grand. It wasn't necessarily a cheap uh, investment, but to me, it was also, you know, the supplement industry is about 50. Can you see me now? Yeah, now my video is off. And now we're back. Um, I believe before I had to to quickly run to work to uh, to finish this interview that you were talking about how examine was 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 a lifestyle was kind of like a lifestyle business yeah so basically you know I, I had no interest in taking external money I didn't want anyone else telling me what to do or how to run the business or how much you know uh, how to implement things uh, similar to what I was talking about you know the comic books and the video games so you know we have no plans or any desire for external funding, we are quite profitable. Um, you know, I did a blog post uh, a few weeks ago, you know, where I said we had 700,000 revenue last year. And, and that is, uh, considering how things are going, that, that will be an outdated number very soon, sooner than later. Um, so considering that we're just a bunch of researchers and a copy editor and uh, one tech guy and me, Right. Our overhead is not really that high anyway. It's just access to papers and, and web hosting, and, and that's about it. So I foresee no reason for any external revenue. I don't want to be a $50 million company or anything like that. I want us to focus on what we do best. You know, people often ask, hey, when are you going to get an exercise? Or it would be awesome if you guys did this. You know, it, what, it might be awesome, but then we would lose what made us special in the first place. So I'm very militant about this is our focus, and we do not lose our focus. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting, and you kind of talked about it earlier, um, you know, with me, I'm pretty sh strongly tied to Signal Tower, uh, you know, a as a whole. But you've kind of tried to, like what you said before, you've tried, kind of tried to replace yourself. It's something that is, um, it's larger than you are. I'm yeah. curious, uh, you know, how, <clears throat> and this may be a little hard to articulate, but I'm curious how you've gone about and done that. Well, one of the things is I have absolutely no desire for fame or e-fame. <clears throat> like, you know, we're doing this interview because I am the businessman at this time. But if we were to do this in six months in the future, then it would be Kamal. And he could say, you know, Saul started and, and all this and all this. So uh, I had, uh, you know, a lot of people do like seeing their name and print and all that kind of stuff. But I have no desire for that. Uh, again, I like my simple lifestyle. I like my anonymous lifestyle. The only thing I haven't given up is my Schwarzenegger advisory board position. That's the only one that, <laughs> that I'm going to hold on to no matter what. But other than that, to be honest, so, you know, because I knew that I didn't want the brand to be me and I didn't want people to associate with me, plus, you know, I am not the nutritional supplementation wizard. That's not who I am, right? I'm not the one who can say, hey, yeah, this enzyme works with this. I don't have that knowledge. 
And Curtis himself had no desire to be, you know, he likes the research. He wouldn't mind being uh, known in research circles, but he has no desire to be known in mainstream circles and stuff like that. So it really aligned up well that the focus was always on the brand. I mean, the, the common face is the appeal to authority, which is saying, oh, you know, because I'm an authoritative figure in this, I must know something about Y or Z, right? M medical doctors don't get a lot of nutrition training, but they're famous for telling you, you know, you should do this for your nutrition, you should do that for the nutrition. So my focus has always been from day one is build a brand, have people trust what the brand is. I mean, my original viewpoint 15 years ago was, you know, then you can sell it and then you don't have to worry about someone else saying, hey, you know, you're no longer involved with, with this brand. Right. So, I've always put examine.com in front of our authors, in front of that, because I want people to also focus on the research and not say, hey, this person has a PhD in this and not a PhD in that. Well, focus on the research. If there's something wrong with it, then something wrong with it. It doesn't matter who stated it. So It's interesting. It's been a very conscious uh, decision throughout the process. Well, and as you, as, as examine grows and you kind of... Um you know, you're trying to find someone to replace you or in the process of that. Once that happens, what, you know, what's next for you? Where is your, where is your focus? Well, uh, I think in some ways examine.com will always be my baby. I mean, other things I've built have been very tech oriented. Like, oh, you know, I was in Daily Deals, for example. I built a Daily Deals aggregator. Again, that was for me, but it didn't require uh, that much human resources. You know, I, I hired a programmer to run it to understand what's going on and stuff like that. As for me, I mean, I'm not sure, to be honest. Uh, I had a deal to run marijuana.ca to kind of in an examine.com similar manner, but I decided, excuse me, I decided against it. It was just too much effort. It was a lot of commitment. Um, I would love, I just read a book on, um, shoot, I can't remember the book's name, but it was, a, it was basically on dog psychology. It was about the unwealth of a dog, basically, you know, what is going through a dog's process. You know, we, we oftentimes associate uh, our emotions and our physical manifestation to what dogs, right? So if dogs yawn, they must be bored. Or if they're, if dogs are panting, they must be tired, really. But it's not always the same. So I would love to do something like examine where I look at, where we look at pet research. But of course, it wouldn't be as uh, exhaustive as examine because the research is maybe, you know, 5% in terms of right. scope, breadth, and depth. Um, and, and the one thing I've always wanted to do is I've always wanted to index all of Toronto's businesses on company that does it in the UK, local data company, and they've been around now for over a decade, and I knew them from my local SEO days, and I've always wanted to do that. So I own Torontonian.com, I think I need a budget of half a million, and I'm not sure if I'm ready to set aside that much money to say, you know, not having to take external funding on and say, all right, you know, now I need to hire a GIS guy, and I need to hire that. So uh, I guess the quick answer is I honestly don't know. I like to do something small for 2015 if I even do anything at all, and then maybe 2016, you know, when that itch kind of hits you again, where you can't help it, and you want to build something grand, you want to build something big, when that hits me, well, then we'll see whatever interests me at that time. I feel like that's a that's a pretty natural thing, wanting to to work on creating something. Obviously, you can't be go, go, go all the time, but, um, uh, you know, that's it, interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I was reading, uh, should I forget what read, book I was reading, but they're saying, you know, that even... Uh, even running a business is kind of being like an artist. Oh yeah, I was reading about uh, small giants where the guys, uh, uh, this author for, this writer for Inc. Magazine, he talks about, I think it was a dozen companies that uh, are not focused only on growth, but they're focused on being an awesome business and, and whatever they define as awesome, right? So I think running a business has a, a certain level of artisticness to it, managing people, managing expectations, making sure everyone's on the same, um, where it escapes me right now, but on the same plan and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so, you know, you step away for a while and you kind of <clears throat> rejuice and get your energies back. But eventually, you know, that creativity kind of comes out and you, you want to run something. And, and money is nice, but I know money is not a big thing for me. So, uh, you know, once that, once that craving hits and once that itch comes, you can't really fight it that hard. One thing that's not necessarily related to entrepreneurship or exam that I'm a little interested about is you did mention earlier you changed your name or decided to change your name. Yes. Um, I'm curious why you decided that. What what sparked that? Well, uh, I am very independent. Uh, my life story is full of things I've done uh, that were uh, about establishing myself in, in my own world and whatnot. And uh, so my viewpoint with my name was always that I did not get to choose my name. 
Uh, as it happened, my father's last name, my father's first name is my last name. My father's last name is his father's first name. So there was no family heritage to preserve anyway to say, you know, I come from a you know, 19th generation of Orwells or, or whatever my name was before. And so I decided, you know, I, I don't feel like I am whatever my old name was. I feel like a new name is in, in play. And uh, so for six months, I would go to parties or events and I'd introduce myself as a new name. I'd be like, hi, I'm whatever, right? And then you kind of get a reaction. You're like, how do I feel saying hi, I'm whatever? And you'd also, inevitably the discussion would also show up like, yeah, he's, you know, I'm looking to change my name. And they'd be like, oh, you know, people would give you suggestions and whatnot. So it was also, it was, it was just a lot of fun experience. Um, and a lot of my friends, you know, make fun of me that hi, I'm Saul is one of the most common things I ever say, because I like the way it sounds, to be honest. You know, I, I go to bars and I remember I meet people and then we talk about, oh, our names are memorable. And then we bet each other whose name is more memorable. And then I go around asking, 10 people in the bar, hey, you know, what name do you remember better? Saul or whatever the person's name is. Inevitably, Saul tends to win. Just because, you know, there's a sun, there's a beer, it's a currency in Peru, it's a salutation, but uh, it just fit really well. And, and I can say that number two on my list was Logan, uh, who is Wolverine, and who is hairy like me, short like me, Canadian like me, and strives to be the best at whatever he does like me. So uh, it, it, was, it was between Saul and Logan at the end, but uh, Saul won out, so. That's funny. Um, is do you are you get just are you getting any feedback? The AC in here just turned on. Is there? Yeah, any weird... I'm hearing a little bit of a, of a rustling or a whirring. Or, or Let's see. Well, it's all right. I'm not at home, unfortunately. I don't know that there's anything I can do about it. But uh, so that's that's interesting. So you you basically you kind of were like split testing your name, going out and talking to people about it. That's. That's, uh, you know what? I never actually thought of it that way. But you, you were doing you were doing some A/B testing on on what was the most memorable name. Yeah, the one that I felt most comfortable. With. And and I guess in that way, you know, the winning choice was whichever one uh, tickled my fancy the most, and and Saul came out of hand. Yeah, I like that. I'm gonna say I A/B tested my name. That's funny. All right. I um, like that. That? Well, and and talking about A/B testing, I'm curious what what types of tests are you guys running on uh, on examine. So our our tech guy Andre, he uh, you know he's well versed in CRO. You know he's uh, done conversion upsell. Uh, he's like their certification, all that kind of stuff. And so we are baking mixed panel and optimizely and quality rule into the system and surveys. So those are the four let, let's say testing we do. So every time someone buys from us, we ask them. You know we'll say. Every, every month we give away, let's say, 10 free copies or we refund 10 copies and we say, hey, you know, you bought this and we'd love to know why you bought it. So we ask them what the motivation was, what their background is, and, and whatnot. So that's one. Qualaroo is, our, uh, is the serving tool that goes in the bottom right. Um, so, you know, someone's on a web page and will say, hey, did you find what you're looking for? Uh, that has a lot of uh, noise in it, I have to be honest, but we get about 20,000 visitors a day and it is the most effective way for us to get a lot of feedback quickly across our various pages. So we've been able to implement changes, right? People had a few questions and they weren't seeing them answered or people were confused. Uh, like originally it was just uh, dosage and then we changed dosage to how to take because people did not realize that the, the verbiage that people use is what we started using. And then optimizing a mixed panel is more for, yeah, you know, we'll split test uh, headlines on our sales page or we'll split test the, the length or we'll split test, you know, does having this logo matter or does having this matter? So um, right now, I'll admit we haven't done that much just because we're baking it into the system and I'm more focused on getting the new system out because that's part of me leaving Examine so I can give these people you know, the power they need to do what they need to do. But um, Optimizely is basically, you know, it lets you dynamically insert changes via JavaScript. And then Mixpanel tells you all the information, right? you know, where they're getting referred from, uh, what process pathway they're using, how affiliates are doing, stuff like that. So um, that's the kind of testing and, and uh, I, I don't like using the word split testing. I, I more like, you know, analytics or quantifying data where, you know, split testing is, is very simplistic, but you also need to know what to split test, right? We can split test colors. I was, you know, the famous Google example of 56 blue colors or whatever they did, but they've got the traffic to test it. Right, so there's also the opportunity cost of testing. If we're making, we make about 10, 15 sales a day, and you want 100 sales per test, so you need 200 sales to do an A-B test. So we can't be just willy-nilly throwing out tests when we can only basically do one, one and a half a, a month. 
So you also have to have the, the uh, analysis behind it to know what you're testing and why you're going to test it. So that's kind of our viewpoint on that. That's fair. Um, I'd like to kind of move in and, and talk a little bit about email. I've got a couple questions about your new project. But um, sure. what, I'm curious what role email marketing plays at Examine. Right. So uh, right now, email is not a big part of what we do. Uh, and that is not a good thing. I'll be the first one to admit it. Uh, one thing I have noticed, though, I, I do want to make a general regret, is you know, everyone tells you you need to collect emails, you need to collect emails, you need to have options, you need to do this. But there's very few websites that actually talk about what the hell you do once you get those emails. Right. right? They'll say you should split test, but they don't say, you know, there's very little coverage on frequency and building trust and how to utilize email and how to build an I mean, we talk about funnels a lot, right, in marketing and all that kind of stuff. But they don't talk about how to build trust in the funnel that much or what to do with the information that you're getting from the emails. So there's a big gap in my opinion, in, my opinion in that area. But uh, moving back to it right now, I mean, we've been at it now for two and a half years. We have, I think, 35, 40,000 emails, which is a pity, a pity uh, compared to what we should have, um, just because it was never a big focus of ours. But what we are doing is, you know, there are people who kind of want to know about supplementation, but we wouldn't want to sell like a beginner's guide just because it wouldn't be that long. Right. At the same time, uh, you know, we've always angled ourselves as a repository. So once we're starting adding articles, it kind of starts diluting what our focus is, which is blunt force information, right? So we will likely do uh, like, you know, a beginner's guide to supplementation where, hey, you know, do you want to know about the 10 most popular supplements? you know, here's a, give us your email and we'll send you our report on it, which is like five or 10 pages, useful information. Um, that's part of it. Uh, and then, and then there, I mean, we do a newsletter once every three, four weeks. And uh, I have a lot of people that I know who are in marketing who complain, not complain, but they, they, they tell me, you know, you need to do better, that you need to email them more and you need to do this again and this and this and this. But again, you know, this to me is a lifestyle business and how would I want to do it? You know, you send me more, uh, an email more than uh, one, every two weeks and I'm just going to get annoyed or I'm not really read it. So I'll admit we are not about maximizing revenue or profit at all times. It's also maximizing what we feel is user behavior, part of which is, of course, a guy by the uh, an email about once a month and our open rates and click rates are, of course, astronomical compared to the industry average and, and we're kind of okay with that position. Well, that is, that's pretty good. Um... And so that kind of leads into kind of the, the next topic I want to touch on. Um, you sent me a link to uh, Audience Owl. Yes. Um, would you tell us a little bit about that? So I should have actually, I guess, mentioned it when you asked me about how outreach happened. Um, when we talk about emails also, right, uh, you hear about social mining and you hear about looking at your followers and that kind of stuff. But it boggles my mind that of all the, the ways to follow, if we look at just Facebook versus Twitter versus Instagram versus uh, email, email is the most personal, right? It's the hardest one to get from someone. Getting a like or getting a follow is super easy because it's already push, or, or sorry, it's already uh, pull, right? They have to pull it f uh, from you. They have to go to Twitter to get your information. They have to go to Facebook to get your information. It's very pull or, uh, organized. Um, whereas email is very push, right? Once we have their email, we push information to them. We are not on their schedule. They're in some ways on our schedule. So we we're getting these email lists, and I was, you know, I was looking at who our followers, and you see, you know, some athlete following us, and some big wig following us. And you're like, yeah, you know, I've got, we've got these fans, and you reach out to them. And I was thinking, well, you know, what about who is on our email list? You know, people are giving us our email list, uh, their email address, and we have no idea who they are. So that's why, like, we started developing this two years ago, and again, it goes through the process of where I build stuff for myself. And our, our viewpoint was, okay, you know, we have all these email addresses, so we should make sense of it. So there are all these APIs out there, Full Contact, Reportive, RapLeaf, these guys, uh, Tower Data, all these guys. And they give you this disparate information on your email list or on the emails you give them. And so Audience Owl is something I built with uh, a friend of mine. And we use it internally. And what we do is that every day, uh, it downloads all of our latest email signups, user registrations and signups for our newsletter. And so there's about like 50 to 100 emails that it gets every day. And then it analyzes those emails. And then it sends me an email saying, here are the 100 people who have signed up, and here are the most influential people, and here's their biographies. So every day, part of my description is to look at who has signed up to our email list and see who I should potentially reach out to. 
you know so for example let's hypothetically say you had signed up and you had some nutrition podcast right i would see you know here's a uh, sam solomon and here's his bio and here's his linkedin information it's also kind of scary about how much information you can derive from an email but you know here's his bio and i've seen your bio you know again it takes it takes a minute to look at 100 biographies when they're you know 140 characters so i see your bio that you've got a nutrition podcast and i'll be like wait a minute it would behoove me to reach out to this person and so I might say, hey, Sam, I saw that you're following us on your email list. I just wanted to reach out to you. You know, is there anything I can help you with or is there anything you're, uh, you're interested in? Uh, part of my, uh, my thing is, of course, you know, I'm retired. So I have a lot of idle time on my hands. And this is actually true, especially lately. I find by 11 o'clock, I'm like, well, I have really nothing to do today. Come on, and Curtis, they're all, they're all, they're all deal, dealing with it. I've literally got nothing to do. So I'd be like, you know what? I really have nothing to do. You can add me on Facebook. If you have any questions that you had, uh, that you're thinking about, I'll be happy to answer them. So it's this kind of, uh, I mean, again, I should have mentioned this earlier, but it's this kind of proactive uh, outreach that, you know, people are following me. So I should see who is interested in what we're doing and, and say hi to the influencers in the, in the marketplace. So that is what Audience Owl is. It's basically, if you have an email list, we will process the email list for you. And if you're using any of the major ESPs, the email service providers, you know, they all have APIs. So you can get a daily email, you can get a weekly email, you can get a monthly email, and we'll analyze who your email list is. I mean, there's also demographic information, location information. So you can also say, hey, this person's in San Francisco, they've got a thousand Twitter followers, and they're following maybe 50 people, maybe, and you know, I'm in San Francisco, maybe I wanna reach out to them and say, hey, you know, you wanna grab a, a cup of tea or a cup of coffee? because it's also useful to reach out to your users and find out how they're using it, right? And find out what compelled them to use your website, what compelled them to sign up. So it's more for the people who are proactive, but if you are proactive, I feel like it's been a, a godsend for us in terms of uh, networking and building up our uh, reputation. Uh, it's definitely a good idea, and it's funny, after you sent me that link, uh, Signal Tower is recently featured on Product Hunt and uh, nice. and was on Product Hunt. And so I was actually going through with all the emails I gained, looking through like who works at Facebook or MailChimp exactly. or whoever that uh, I can see. So I was actually manually doing exactly what um, Audience Al is, is kind of meant to solve. Um, exactly. So that's interesting. And you were taught, and that kind of goes back to what you said at the beginning of the interview about kind of just like going out and reaching out to people and, and doing things. It's kind of a tool to, to help people do that. So I, uh, that's interesting. I mean, and, and I'll admit, like sometimes you fall to the rabbit hole, right? Uh, you'll see, like, you know, uh, I mean, you're not a perfect example when you contact me, you know, I go through your website and suddenly two hours later I'm just like, shit, you know, I just spent this, 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 this time reading it. But you also then build a connection with these people, right? Like I'm not, in no way do I ever suggest doing anything superficial. Uh, copy pasting and all that is garbage. I don't believe in that at all. Uh, I guess we should be very explicit about that. I think that's part of our, of our successes. I've never copy pasted. I've always read about people. Uh, 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 read their story. Everyone has very interesting stories. People, most people don't know it, but everyone has a very interesting background. Uh, you know, there's a, a collusion of events that have made them who they are at that moment in time, right? So when you read people's blogs and their and their Twitter feed and their Facebook and see their Instagram pictures, you, you kind of get an understanding, a sense of who they are. So when you reach out, you're not just this anonymous person. You're this person who you know that they're following you, in, like, you know, an audience all's case, but you've also looked at what they do and you've kind of built a little bit of a connection. And, and I think that's really important that people sometimes miss, you know, business is business. But at the end of the day, if you really like someone, you will find a way to work with them. And I think that's very, very uh, important. Um, but and, and to keep speaking, it also ties into my thing of, you know, it, a lot of the stuff I do is organically built. Uh, I don't set out to build X or Y or Z. It just so happens it's an interest to me or something I built for myself. So audience all is that exact same thing. Definitely. Um, we're kind of reaching the end of the interview and this is, Besides all of my internet connection issues and whatnot, I think this has been a really, really fantastic interview. Um, I'm Very curious happy. if you've got kind of any last thoughts or advice uh, you'd offer to, to entrepreneurs out there. From my viewpoint, I think uh, people try to do too much and they, they try to be too successful in everything. Uh, I'm a big fan of the book called uh, So Good They Can't Ignore You. And even though the, the, the central thesis of the book is that passion is in ways overrated because it's not what makes you excellent at something, uh, I think the title is equally important. Uh, from the start, our viewpoint with exam or anything I do is, you know, we're so good that people have to use us if, it's, if it applies to them, right? 
And I think people try to do the Facebook marketing and they try to be on Instagram and they try to do Twitter and they're trying to blog and they're trying to do this or trying to do that. Um, you know, you can make money from just focusing on one thing and almost everything, right? You, there are people who are only on Instagram who are making hundreds of thousand dollars a year. Same for Facebook and same for Twitter. Maybe not Twitter. Twitter is terrible for conversions, but uh, you know, you don't need to be the master of Google AdWords and of Facebook ads and of this and of that. Just focus on one thing, carve out a niche for yourself. And once you're big enough, just hire people who know what they're doing. Like there's no reason for you to be the master of all. You be the master of one little thing and that is very, very valuable because there's actually few masters. Um, I truly believe there's very few masters in, in most fields, just people are trying to do everything and, and, and anything they can do. Um, and that, and that, you know, that goes with our thing, like I was mentioning, where people say, oh, you should get into exercise, you should get into this. Well, exercise physiology is completely different from you know, human metabolism. So there's no reason for us to go into it other than to dilute our knowledge. So uh, I think focus is a big thing, everyone. And, and the other thing is, you know, everyone thinks you're gonna have this overnight hit, you're gonna be on TechCrunch, and you're gonna be on Better List, and this and this, and suddenly, you know, you're super internet savvy, sensation, and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's the equivalent of winning the lottery. I mean, people win the lottery, but are you going to actually, uh, you know, follow <laughs> follow the outline of a lottery winner? No, right? There's a lot of grit. There's a lot of grind. There's a lot of iteration. There's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Um, but if you focus on one thing, I think it's usually uh, worthwhile. Well, Saul, where can people find you? Well, you know, primary website is examine.com, and our project is Audience Owl, that the one I mentioned. And I do blog on SaulOrwell.com, usually just uh, nonsensical stuff. But uh, you know, sometimes it's nice to have a have an outlet to to let uh, let whatever you're feeling out. So, yeah, definitely. Well, as I as I said before, thank you for uh, putting up with uh, internet issues, and, th and thanks yeah, no for problem. joining me. No problem. It was my pleasure.